Let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord our God, who has honored us with your own image, who has taught your elect, so that the most wise are they who give heed to your teaching, who reveals wisdom to babes, who has imparted wisdom. Open the hearts, the minds, and the lips of these your servants, that we may receive the power of your law, and successfully apprehend the useful precepts to the glory of your holy name, to the profit and upbuilding of your holy church, and that we understand your good and perfect will. Deliver us from every hostile oppression and preserve us in orthodoxy and your holy Catholic and apostolic faith, in all uprightness and purity all the days of our lives, that we may advance in wisdom and in the fulfillment of your commandments, that being thus prepared we may glorify your most holy name and become heirs of your kingdom. For you are the God of mercy and gracious and strength, and to you we send up glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever and into the ages of ages. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, good morning again and welcome. I want to welcome everyone to our first session. I'm very excited of the new adult education program. We decided to start this up. Uh, we had a lot of people that were asking us uh, about possibly restarting because I believe at some point there was a, a Sunday, adult Sunday school session that was here after church and a lot of people had expressed interest in getting it going again and a lot of people had questions about the divine liturgy which is why we decided to uh, pick that as our theme. As Christians of course our spiritual growth and the deepening of our wisdom as Christians uh, never really ends. Even though we're too old for Sunday school so to speak we can still learn about our faith through the study of the scriptures, through spiritual books, and even by just coming to church. Really, the church is the only classroom that we need, the divine services. If that was all we had, if we didn't have anything else, no books, no teachers, no anything like that, we would still be okay as Christians. We would, have, we would learn everything that we need to know. So really, this program is not to replace anything or to uh, kind of take over any other learning that you might be doing yourself, but to be an extension of the divine liturgy, to be an extension of our worship, and uh, to supplement the education that already provides for us. As I said, our theme for the three sessions we're going to be doing, we're going to be once a month for the next three months. Our theme is the Divine Liturgy. One thing we're not going to be doing in these three sessions is going through the service step by step, because really it's impossible in three 40, 30 to 45 minute sessions to go through the entire Divine Liturgy. It would be unfair to the service, unfair to to even to God Himself, but most, most, most unfair to us, we'd have to rush through uh, such a beautiful and rich worship service that we have. So if we desire, if we want to keep it going in the fall, we can continue in the fall by doing that. Uh, for now, we're going to look at the Divine Liturgy more in broad terms, broad perspectives. So we're going to answer the questions. How do we view coming to church? How does the liturgy help me grow closer to Christ? And why is the liturgy so important to us as Orthodox Christians? Just to give you an outline of kind of our three sessions that we're going to have. Today we're going to be talking about the liturgy and the church as heaven on earth. Okay, how what we do in our churches, in these four walls that we have here in the altar and the pews and all these things, how it reaches beyond these four walls. It reaches into heaven itself and heaven comes down to us. Next month we're going to kind of continue on the same theme, but we're going to you know, have heaven on earth, but we're going to approach it from in terms of what we see in church. Um, my hope is to bring out many of the liturgical items, to talk a little bit about the church architecture, especially since we have such a beautiful church upstairs, to talk about iconography, some of the things that we see in church, and how those point us to Christ and to the reality of Jesus Christ. Finally, we're going to talk in our last session about uh, the liturgy as really the true miracle of Christianity. And how this is the main action that we have as Christians. How the liturgy is really what defines us as Orthodox Christians. So with a spirit of humility on the feast day of the, or the, the, the Sunday of the uh, publican and the Pharisee, which has its theme of humility, um, may we also with humility and a desire and thirst for wisdom from God, let us begin. 
So I would like to start out by sharing a story that comes from a monastery in Russia. So one day in this monastery, the liturgy was taking place. And in the monasteries, the monks, they all have their special jobs. They all have the, this one's the cook, this one cleans the church, this one takes care of the gardens. They all have their own jobs. So this one monk was told to sweep the entrance of the church really well. So during this part of the liturgy, he said, eh, th this part of the liturgy is not that important. It's no big deal. So I'm going to go and I'm going to take care of my chores now, so I don't have to do it later. So he was praying. He was praying silently. He was doing his Jesus prayer. And he was sweeping. And every few, second, you know, few minutes, few moments, he would look over to kind of see what was going on, to check in to see what point of the service they were on. So not even five minutes into his sweeping and cleaning up, he saw the dome of the church splitting open. And it was revealing a vision of heaven to him. So what did this monk see? He saw a holy altar table, which was very large. In front of the altar, he saw three bishops who were kneeling in prayer, who were surrounded by other bishops and priests and deacons. To the right and the left of this altar were choirs, just like we have choirs in our churches. But these choirs were not of people. They were of angels who were there in all of their glory and their beauty. The melodies that they chanted were like flowing honey. And they filled this monk with blessedness and joy. So what this monk realized was that he was seeing a vision. He was witnessing a divine liturgy taking place, not on earth, but in heaven. And he knew it was a liturgy because what they were doing, how they were celebrating the liturgy, was similar to how we celebrate the liturgy on earth. However, the bishops were not earthly bishops. They were saints. St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian, St. John Chrysostom, and all of the many great hierarchs of our church were all there. So this monk was amazed, obviously, by what he saw. And he was motionless. He was just kind of stuck in his spot. He couldn't move until the liturgy was over. And as the rest of the monks were leaving, they saw the brother monk just kind of standing there. And so they were trying to find out from him what was going on, what happened, but he couldn't speak. He was so overwhelmed by what he had seen, he could not even speak to tell them what had happened. So they had to, and he was weeping. His, they said, the story says that his coat was wet with his tears. So they had to take him and lift him and carry him back to his room so that he could recover. And finally, he was able to recover and told the story to the others. And this is how we get that story passed down to us today. So what, sometimes when we hear stories like this, they may seem a little fantastical or like too amazing to be true. But what the church teaches us about the liturgy is what this monk saw in his vision. What do I mean by that? What the monk saw taking place in heaven simultaneously does happen when we're serving the liturgy here on earth. So while we're serving liturgy here on earth, there is a liturgy taking place in heaven with the saints, with Christ, and with all of the heavenly orders. So to put it simply, the divine liturgy that we're doing here on earth is heaven itself. We'll get, into a little, that'll be, we'll get into that more as we go on. A few patristic quotes on this theme. St. John Chrysostom once said, The church, meaning the church structure, the building, is the place of the angels, of the archangels. It is the kingdom of God and heaven itself. St. Germanos, who was famous for writing a commentary on the liturgy, and he, many of the things that we teach about the liturgy come from him, he says similarly, the church is an earthly heaven in which the heavenly God dwells and moves. So what does this mean for us as Christians? What are the implications? First of all, it means that when we come to church, when we come to the church, even here at Panagias, we are stepping into heaven itself. When we come to church, we're not only joined by the people who we see around us, but we are surrounded by angels, by saints, by the Theotokos and even Christ himself. And when we come to church, the actions that we do, the prayers that we say, the hymns that we chant, and all of those things are taken up and lifted up into heaven, something, into something much greater than ourselves, something beyond this world that we know, and into something eternal, into heaven itself. So these are kind of the points we're going to be focusing on today. So I wanted to take a moment, I need to get the projector going, to show you some icons that I found that kind of give us a visual of what this reality is. So give us one second to set up the projector screen and the, uh, I'll, I'll be able to show you those. Now, what we're seeing in these icons, 
Should look pretty familiar. Do we see anything that are, we can recognize? We see angels, good, we see angels, yeah. How are the angels dressed? Deacons. They're dressed like deacons, yes, exactly. They have, the way we know is they have this sash here. This is the sash of the deacon. What are they holding? The yes, the covering, just like we have on the altar table here, they're holding the covering. And the other angel is holding one of the fans, just like the altar boys hold during the liturgy. So they're doing a liturgical action using the same kind of things that we do. Okay, similar thing, but we see a few new things. What else do we see in this icon? We see a sensor, good, we see a sensor. The angel's holding something here. Not really sure what that is. It could be um, the box, the artophorio and the box on the altar table, which holds the holy gifts for during the year. Um, and again, they're dressed as deacons. Okay, so now we kind of get a fuller picture. We've seen up here so far. Now we have a new character here. What is he holding? What is this angel holding? Yeah, he's holding one of the holy gifts. It's kind of hard to tell if it's the, the body or the, or the blood of Christ. But the angel is holding one of the holy gifts. So now what does this kind of look like? What is this? What, it, should be some, it looks like a, a procession, right? Good. It looks like a procession. It looks like specifically like the great entrance. Like when I, with the altar boys, when I go around the church and I come up the middle aisle taking the holy gifts. So it's a procession of the holy gifts. We're kind of getting the more full picture as we go along. Next slide, please. Okay. Now we have two angels. They're each holding one of the holy gifts. And what do we have in the middle? We have the altar table. Good. And on the altar table here, we have... What is that? The gospel book. Yes. Just like we have. You can even see it's decorated. Similar to the way that we decorate our gospel books. And the, the altar, this type of altar covering is actually very traditional. It's very old. It's a very uh, old way of doing, like a Yosofia used to have an altar table like that with that covering over the top. And some, uh, some very old monasteries and churches will still put those on. Or very, if they have a lot of money and they like, to, they like those kinds of things, they'll put it in their church. So we're seeing again the, this image of the great entrance. The deacons bringing the gifts to the table, and they're waiting now for the bishop. Whenever the deacon is serves, he does not, he's not able to place the gifts on the table himself. He has to wait for the priest or the bishop to do it for him. So now we have, this is a little bit of a, it's a little fuzzier to see. It's a little bit older. It was damaged at some point. We see now some new characters. Who do we see? We see Christ. Christ is here. How is Christ dressed? He's dressed, not like a priest, actually. He's dressed like a bishop. Exactly. He's dressed like a bishop. Christ is dressed, dressed like a bishop, and he's receiving... Here you see the altar table again. He's receiving the, uh, the altar boy... Well, the, the angels here are like the altar boys holding candles. We have the angels on the top holding fans, okay? Just like the great entrance. And then we have... You can see here, this angel has on his back a cape kind of thing. Okay, this cape is the, called the ayer. It's what the priest wears when he goes, or the deacon, when he does the great entrance. He puts that little cape thing on. That's what the deacon is wearing here. And he's holding the holy cup. So now the bishop is blessing the gifts, and he's getting ready to take them into the holy altar. And we see this is one of the uh, cher uh, seraphim, I believe. I believe the seraphim are the uh, six wings. I'm not exactly sure. I have to brush up on my uh, angel theology. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Forgive me. Uh, so we see an angel also in the altar as well. And our church teaches that every altar table that's been consecrated has an angel protecting it and guarding it. Okay. okay, we see here a little bit of more of a clear picture of what we just saw. We have Christ in the center as the bishop. Fans again, like the altar boys. And then we have the two angels bringing the gifts, and he's also wearing, as you can see, the air, the cape, which has an icon of Christ on the back. The crucified Christ is being buried in the tomb. Same idea. Now here is an interesting depiction of the gifts. Because we see the gifts being covered by the cover, but it doesn't look like a plate with bread and wine anymore. What does it look like? The child Christ. Because the, body, the gifts at some point, of course, are consecrated, and they become... The body and blood of Christ. Okay, go ahead. This is an icon, a more clear icon of uh, Christ as the archpriest. Christ as the bishop. 
and we can see Christ dressed up exactly as the bishop would be dressed up. It's 100% accurate to how the bishops dress. All of the articles that the bishop wears, Christ is wearing in this icon. So it's interesting that we have Christ depicted as a clergyman serving a liturgy with angels and as his altar boys and deacons. Go ahead. Here, he, here Christ is doing what? Saying it, he's, the, he's actually, he, is, he has the gifts in his hands and he's doing what? What does it look like he's doing to them? He's distributing them. So he's giving communion. He's not giving it to regular people though. Who is he giving it to? He's giving it to his, the apostles, the 12 apostles. So we have Christ. Here's the bread broken into pieces. Here's the wine with the cup, the gospel book in the middle. And he's handing out the Eucharist, as we see the icon is titled, the Holy Eucharist. And he's communing his apostles who, and the saints, and all the saints in heaven. Of course, we can't fit all the saints in one icon, so the apostles are representative of all the saints. We see also the altar table decorated, just like if you look at our altar table, they're decorated similarly. And I believe this is the last one. I just wanted to do a little close-up so you can see Christ clearly distributing the uh, gifts to the apostles. So now my point in showing these icons, where you, you can close the computer. Um, my point in showing these icons was to show uh, kind of the same image that the monk saw in his vision in the church. He, you know, the, the heavenly divine liturgy. And as I said, when we serve a liturgy here in Panagias or any Orthodox church, there is another liturgy taking place. Obviously, there are other liturgies taking place across the world. But there's another liturgy taking place also in heaven. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means for us in just a second. So now, what this teaches us really is that the liturgy is kind of like an intersection. Just like when we're driving along the street and we have an intersection of two streets, okay? It connects people from different areas, okay? The liturgy is an intersection, but it's not an intersection, uh, uh, geographically speaking, it's an intersection of heaven and earth. It is a connecting point. It is a union point where heaven and earth come together Bishop Galistos Ware, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he is a modern Orthodox theologian, and he's a bishop from England. He was a Protestant at one point and came to Orthodoxy, and he's a well-renowned theologian at this point. He says that the earthly and the heavenly worlds are joined together in unity. Whether there are few people in church or many people in church, the members of the congregation form a part of a larger, all-embracing drama. And this drama, of course, that he's talking about is the liturgy that's taking place in heaven. So he's saying that when we come to church, even if there's one person in church, of course there has to be at least one person besides the priest, the priest cannot serve by himself, they are taking their place in heaven with the angels and with the saints. Now, this union is really clear, the church makes it really clear, during the part of the liturgy where the gifts are consecrated. So we bring the gifts, we have the great entrance, we bring the gifts into the altar, we place them on the table, we read our petitions, and then we have this part of the service, which is the consecration of the gifts. And the priest prays okay, to come for the Holy Spirit to come down. And to come down and make the bread the precious body of Christ. And to make the wine in the cup the precious blood of Christ. So this is what our church teaches about this part of the service. This is the part when we're all kneeling as well. It's the kneeling part sometimes called. So our church teaches is that what happens is that the gifts we're offering are taken in a mystical way into heaven. Okay? The bread and the wine, the simple bread and wine that we bring to church, which are when we bring them are just bread and wine, they're taken into heaven, into the liturgy with Christ. And Christ takes our offering to Him as a gift, and He associ associates them with Himself. So in other words, he's, He is the one that makes them into His body and blood. And then the Holy Spirit brings them back to us, in a mystical way. Again, we don't see this physically with our eyes. We don't have the eyes of faith to see these things happen. But the Holy Spirit brings them down to us again in the form transformed into the body and blood of Christ. Elder Emilianos, who is a spiritual master from Greece, he says that at this moment, at this awesome moment, Christ receives our gifts, our whole life, which we offer to Him, and He places them upon the heavenly altar. And by them being on the heavenly altar, they become His body and blood. And He receives us as well. So Christ not only takes our gifts, but He takes us with Him into heaven. So Christ unites our gifts with His body and blood. 
And the Holy Spirit, as I said, returns them here on earth transformed. So here we can see plainly the two, the two, the two worlds coming together. The two-way movement, he, uh, Bishop Gallistos likes to call it. We travel upwards to heaven, and heaven travels downwards to us. Bishop Gallistos again says, These realms of earth and heaven are no longer separated. He says they are united, and each realm embraces one another. So my first point, just to recap, was that our divine liturgy in our churches are heaven on earth. They're an intersection, a colliding, a meeting point of heaven and earth. As we said, heaven comes down to us, we go up to be in heaven. The second point I'd like to focus on is that if we're in heaven during the liturgy, it stands to reason that we're surrounded by the citizens of heaven. What do I mean by citizens of heaven? The citizens of heaven, the church teaches us, are the saints. The church triumphant, they're called. The church triumphant are those who have lived this life, have triumphed over evil and the passions and the temptations, and have been welcomed into God's kingdom. Together with them, we make the church one church. Heavenly church, earthly church. Church militant, church, church triumphant, and the church militant, meaning we're still fighting. We're still making our way up there. So the saints are with us during the liturgy. Many times... Uh, you know, during the week especially, we ser I serve liturgies here in the chapel, and we might have maybe five, if it's a good liturgy, maybe 10 or 15 people. If, it's a, if that's, a, that's a lot for a weekday service. Um, and Kiro Nico, the, the chanter who we love, uh, he's always, he always likes to say, Father, can you imagine a day like this 60 years ago, this church would have been filled. But what, we, what I like to remind him is that when the people are not here, it leaves more room for the saints to come and to be in church with us. So this is also why we have, see in church icons. If you look around us here in St. Catherine, you'll see icons. And the icons are all of the saints. This teaches us, of course, that the saints are with us. They're present. They're not just here just to decorate the church. They're not here so we have something nice to look at. They're here to teach us something. But what those icons teach us is that we're not here by ourselves. We're not here by ourselves. The saints are here with us. Not only the saints, but also those of our loved ones who have departed. Those of our loved ones who have fallen asleep in the Lord, who have entered into the joy of paradise, they're also here with us during the liturgy. Again, we said the liturgy is a union of heaven and earth. So those of our loved ones and our, those who have departed that are in heaven, they join us again here during the liturgy. There's a great story I read of a priest. I like to call him the lazy priest. This is the lazy priest story. There was a liturgy taking place. And uh, it was before the liturgy was taking place the, uh, place, the priest was getting ready in the morning. And he said, oh, it's cold outside. I'm tired. I'm old. I'm an old man. I don't want to serve the liturgy. When I go to church, I hope the chanter doesn't show up so that I don't have to serve. That's what he said. So, that, of course, he gets there, and not according to his will. The chanter's there, and he has to serve. So he gets everything ready very quickly. He's rushing. He's trying to get done as quickly as possible. And at some point he turns and he sees the church, which is usually empty, filling up. He sees people, he sees people in the chant stand, he sees people are coming into the altar to serve in the altar, and he's like, wow, what's going on today? This is very unusual. He says, I feel like I know some of these people, but I can't really recognize them. So before long, the church was packed. He saw the church full of people. He even saw bishops coming in and priests and other people to serve with him in the altar. So he started to serve with warmth in his heart. He warmed up. He said, okay, I can, I'm going to take this seriously now. So as the service was going, the bishops were praying with him. They were blessing him. They were doing the service together. And uh, the time came for Holy Communion. And he uh, turned to the bishops because typically the bishops receive communion first. So he turned to the bishops to ask them if they would like to receive communion. And they gave him the blessing to receive. So after the priest, of course, receives, he prepares the gifts and he turns to give the people communion. But when he came out and he turned from the altar, the church was empty again. And only the chanter came up to receive. At that point, he realized that the people that he saw were not people that are still alive, were all the people that he had known from the church that had passed away. They were the saints and the angels that had come to chant and to serve with him in the altar. Can we let them in or pass through? I feel bad they're kind of trapped back there. So he, uh, <clears throat> so this lazy priest kind of learned his lesson. 
that really what we're doing in the liturgy is not as simple as it, it sometimes seems. So if we're also surrounded by our saints and our loved ones and the departed from this life, we're also surrounded by angels. The church teaches that, as I already said, that every consecrated altar has as a guardian an angel guarding it. So even here now, right now, our church, which has been consecrated here, has an altar protecting it, has an angel protecting it. We say during the prayer of the small entrance, the priest asks God to make our entrance an entrance full of angels and archangels. And we believe this to be true. There's another story of Saint Seraphim of Sarov. Saint Seraphim of Sarov was a saint from, I believe, the 20th century. He lived in Greece. Uh, and he saw when he was a deacon, he was serving liturgy one day, and he saw, as he was doing the small entrance, a mass of people in the back of the church. So he turned and to see what they, who they were, to see what was going on. And he saw that they weren't actually people, but they were hundreds and hundreds of angels that were coming into the church through the entrance. Okay? And he saw them with his eyes. And behind them was Christ. He saw Christ with his eyes, walking into the church, like a bishop would be walking into church. And the angels went into the altar, to the sides, or to the chant stands, to help worship. And Christ walked into his icon, into the iconostasis. Okay? So Saint Seraphim of Sarov saw with his eyes the reality that when we're in church, we're surrounded by angels, archangels, and the church is really full of them. There's another funny story with angels. There's a priest who was a kind of a village priest. Very, he wasn't very learned. So when he was doing the proscomidi service, which is the service of preparation, we'll talk about that next month, um, he's preparing the gifts. He did it kind of the wrong way. He was always doing it the wrong way. He messed up, always messed up one, one thing. So when a bishop came for a, for a memorial service, he saw the priest messing up this part of the, of the preparation. And he said, Father, uh, you switched the one thing with that thing. Please change them. And, when, and he was very grateful, he was very humble that he was taught the right thing. And so when the bishop left that day, the priest who was consuming the gifts turns and says to the angel, he says, I've been messing this up all these years, you haven't said anything to me. What's going on? Why didn't you tell me anything? So this angel was with him every liturgy. He saw him every liturgy. So he says, you're with me every day for liturgy and you didn't tell me I was messing this up. And the angel turns to him and says, well, you're the priest. I'm not really to here to correct you. I'm just here to protect the church and the altar. You have more authority than I do. So um, it just shows again that the angels are with us. They're protecting us and they're present during the liturgy. The last person I want to talk about uh, who is with us when we serve the liturgy is Christ himself. We saw in the icons Christ the archpriest, Christ the bishop. And this is a very important, this is a very important image for us to have in our brains. So if, the deacon, if deacons are present during the liturgy, which we usually don't have in America, but in many places the deacons are still very prominent, the service actually starts with the deacon turning to the bishop and saying, it is time for the Lord to act. It is time for the Lord to act. This is the start of the service. And what the deacon, what we're learning, what we learn from that line is that the liturgy is not performed by flesh and blood. It's not performed by priests and bishops and deacons. It's performed by the Lord. It's the Lord's action. Okay. And really this makes sense because without the Lord, what can we really do as priests? You know, can, we, can I as a priest turn bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ? Absolutely not. Um, uh, some people have kind of a magical interpretation of the church that you know, the priest has magical powers, but that's not true. Whatever we're able to do as priests or even as lay people comes through Christ himself. So Christ is the one that's doing, performing the liturgy. I read a very beautiful line from a saint who said, the priest and the bishops are not really doing anything. All they're doing is giving their hands to Christ to use in the service and their voice so that Christ can speak to his people through the priest and through the bishops. So it is time for the Lord to act. So God is the one that serves the service. That's why we saw him dressed as a bishop. That image is not something that we just have kind of like, oh, cool, look, Christ is dressed up as a bishop. No, it's because that is the reality, that Christ up in heaven is serving liturgy as a bishop, as the hierarch. And who is he offering? Is he offering bread and wine? Of course not. He's offering himself. He's offering his own flesh. He's offering his own blood. He's still sacrificing himself for us 
uh, for all of eternity so that those who love him and those who want to be with him can have complete and perfect communion with him. So without Christ present, really the gifts that we offer will not change. They will not become his body and blood and really the liturgy will be ineffectual for us. So to wrap up, to kind of conclude our points today, the divine liturgy is heaven on earth. If there's one thing I want you to take away for today, that's really the point. The divine liturgy is heaven on earth. It is a foretaste of paradise. Okay? Every time we come to church, we get a little taste of heaven. When we're here, we're joined by all the hosts of heaven, saints, our departed loved ones, angels, the Theotokos, and also Christ himself. When we come to church, we're in the presence of God, truly, really in His presence. Not, we don't just say that to say it, just because it sounds nice. We say it because it's true. And Christ, being in, us being in His presence, He offers Himself to us. We partake of His body and of His blood, and we become one entity with Him. We become part of His body. And this is how we taste paradise. This is how we taste that everlasting life that we're always seeking and always pushing for as Orthodox Christians. So at this time, I'd like to open it up if there are any questions um, from you guys. I'll do my best to answer any questions about the liturgy. Any questions really about anything that you have, I'd be happy to answer. Yes? Sure. Give me one second. I'll grab my book. This, this part of the service is called the anaphora. It's a, right after the creed begins the anaphora. It's a series of petitions. It's the let us stand well, let us stand in awe. We lift up our hearts, we give thanks to the Lord. And then really, once the priest starts taking things off of the gifts, like the gifts I'll show you guys next week. They have like, there's the lisco, the gifts are on top, they're covered by something, they're covered by another thing, they're covered by another thing, and then there's the cover on top. There's like four or five layers. So the priest slowly starts to take things off. Like during the creed, he takes off the big covering. Then when he says, singing the victory hymn, proclaiming, crying out, and saying, he takes off the, we call it the asteri, the star, okay? Which is the metal guard, kind of, that goes over the gifts. And then we take, then when you hear, this is kind of like the key moment, take eat, this is my body. Which makes sense, right? Because those were the words that Christ said when he was starting communion, when he was doing kind of like the first liturgy in the upper room which was, of course, before his crucifixion. He told the disciples, take, eat, this is my body. He didn't say, this is like my body, this is kind of my body. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. So when you hear the priest say that, and then, of course, he says, drink of it, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for the forgiveness of many. That's when, and then we kneel, okay? We say, we offer to you these gifts from your own gifts. And the priest starts to say the prayers of the consecration. So while we're kneeling, that's when the prayers are being read for the Holy Spirit to come down. So we say, once again, this is the priest prayer. Once again, we offer to you this spiritual worship without the shedding of blood. Because of course in the old days, in ancient Jerusalem, they used to sacrifice animals. But Christ did away with that. So without the shedding of blood, we ask, we pray, and we entreat. Send down your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts here presented. And make this bread the precious body of your Christ. Amen. And that which is in this cup, the precious blood of your Christ. Amen. Changing them by your Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So that's really when that moment is when the change happens. Okay? When the Holy Spirit takes our gifts to heaven, God consecrates them, and then they are brought back to us. And from then on, the gifts that are on the table are no longer bread and wine. They're the body and blood of Christ. So the priest has to be very careful not to drop anything, not to spill anything, to really revere and protect that body and blood of Christ. So when the, well, really when we kneel and you hear all those things, that's like the moment that it's happening. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, there was a... Sure. Well, we know that the liturgy in the form that we have today dates back to St. John Chrysostom, which was the 4th century. So, of course, because it's called the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. We also have the liturgy of St. Basil. St. Basil lived shortly after St. John Chrysostom, also in the 4th century. And then we also have the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, which was written by St. Gregory, and that came also a little bit later on. 
So we know that those liturgies existed, have been in existence for 16, 1700 years. Okay? We've been doing it this, pretty much the same way. Um, in the early church, there were also other liturgies that kind of fell by the wayside at some point. At some point, the church, again, you have to remember that the church was spread out all over Europe and the Middle East, Jerusalem, Antioch, Rome, all these places. And so every place kind of did it their own way. You know, they, they all had their own separate liturgies because the contact between the seas and the contact between the Christian lands were not, was not very common. First of all, we had persecutions for three centuries. So it made it very difficult to communicate between Christians. Second of all, the distances were just hard to travel because they didn't have modern day transportation. So there were other liturgies at some point that over the centuries that followed, once the church became more unified, more streamlined, kind of fell away. They were not used anymore. And the church stuck to St. John Chrysostom throughout most of the year and the liturgy of St. Basil, especially during Lent and on certain feast days. So but this liturgy that we have has been around for 1,700 years. So we've been doing for the most of the same way. <laughs> Yeah, it was, a, I mean, a different, different, uh, there were a few things that were different, but the iconostasis has been around in some form or another since the first century. Uh, you know, the, the ch church iconography, they, I mean, we have icons that date back to St. Luke, the, uh, the evangelist who was uh, living in the time of Christ, you know. So iconography, the, you know, the altar tables, things like that, they date back even to the Roman persecutions, second and third century. Now, were they using exactly the, the, the spoon and the lonki and all that stuff? I'm personally, I haven't studied the, the history that much. I know in the old days, people used to receive communion the way the priests receive communion. The, the priests would give the, the body in their hands and they would receive, and they would drink straight from the cup. Now the spoon makes it a little bit easier. So I know that came along a little bit later. So it's not exactly 100% the same way. It has evolved a little bit over the centuries. It is a living entity. The, the liturgy is not a, it's not a museum uh, exhibit, you know, to see, oh, this is how the Christians worshipped 1,700 years ago. It is a living thing. It's part of paradise. It's part of heaven, like we said. Um, so things change as time goes on. Um, but for the most part, the prayers, all those things, they date back to St. John Chrysostom. So very old, wonderful service, yes. Yes. Yeah, and I th we all, you know, we all struggle with that. That's not a, <laughs> that's not a, it's, it's something common to all of humanity. Unfortunately, along with the angels and the saints and all those things, the church teaches us we also have to deal with the other side of things, which is, you know, the devil, the demons that are trying to pull us away. You know, we're trying, when we come to church, we're trying to unite ourselves to Christ. Just like we said at our baptism, right? We unite ourselves to Christ. So we're trying to unite us. We're trying to, you know, to go to heaven. We're trying to be in heaven, to place ourselves in heaven. But the devil makes it his aim to pull us down again, to, to bring us back to earth so that we can't focus, that we can't really participate fully in the mysteries. So it's a common thing, you know, with prayer over time, and a lot of spiritual exercise, we eventually we get over those things, but it's difficult for all of us. But yeah, it is a good it's a good way to you know try to keep yourself on track. Today I was thinking about it, being having prepared for this for the session. You know, I was thinking like this, I'm not really doing anything. You know, I'm just here. I'm with Christ. Christ is standing with me. He's really doing everything. I'm just here for Him, to serve Him. So it's a good reminder for us priests as well. Any other questions, comments? It is 12 o'clock, as you can hear the bells upstairs. So, um, if any, yes, you have a question? Father, could you please uh, do some research and find out what was the liturgy in Constantinople that St. John Chrysostom found when he arrived? Sure. I'll do my best to find that. Sounds good. And Constantinople with Hagia Sophia, once they built Hagia Sophia, things changed too. It became very intricate, very elaborate. The liturgy was a lot different. It was like the whole, litur the whole city was basically doing liturgy together. It was, it was crazy. So we can talk a little bit more about that next time as well. So hopefully I'll be able to find out what, uh, what he had and what he was working with. Again, you have to remember, that was the church had just come out of the persecution. So really, um, the services were probably a lot simpler at that point, probably a lot faster because the services were secret. They, had to sur they were trying to survive at that point, so they didn't want to get, you know, they were trying to avoid being um, martyred. Uh, not avoid it, but 
if they can, you know, if you can live, it's always a good thing too. So, the services I'm sure were a lot different back then than they were once St. John established the liturgy and the church became more established as well. So, I'll do my best to find out what I can. So, if that's uh, all the questions for today, may God bless you all, and um, we'll meet again in about a month. And again, we'll talk. We'll be talking more about the things that we see in church. God bless. In a presbyter's psyche, Os garzo is mi terra, prostin zo in me tes disen, o mi tranikisas, ai.